Jemima's Iron Law of Chastity. Jemima Wilkinson was a bright, fun-loving lass until she joined a weird religious cult. Then she became little short of a monster. One spring day in 1776, the people of Providence, Rhode Island, poured from their homes and shops to gape in astonishment at an extraordinary procession wending its way slowly through the streets. At its head, dressed in masculine garb, rode a tall and beautiful young woman, whose hair fell in long, coal-black tresses over the collar of her military jacket. Behind her horse came a silent file of twenty men and women, clad in white robes, trudging two by two and hand in hand. With the War of Independence setting America aflame, the rebellious colonists of Rhode Island were used to patriotic parades through their towns and villages. But Jemima Wilkinson was not calling on the people to fight King George's redcoats. She was summoning them to repentance and chastity, before the wrath of the Lord covered the land with fiery destruction. The history of religious fanaticism contains many strange and wonderful characters, and none more remarkable in her day than Jemima Wilkinson. The gay, frivolous girl, who once delighted in nothing but French novels and admiring swains, came to be venerated by thousands as the veritable reincarnation of the Holy Spirit. Eventually she aroused such public hostility, stoned and assaulted by furious mobs, she was forced to abandon civilized America to perdition. On the wild Indian frontier she founded a new Jerusalem, and ruled her little colony with a bizarre mixture of piety avarice and tyranny for thirty years until she died. The woman destined for such an eventful career was born on November the 29th, 1752, in the Rhode Island township of Cumberland. The Wilkinsons were a wealthy and highly respected family. Her father was a member of the Colonial Council of Rhode Island, and her mother a Quaker, noted for her religious devotion and good works. Jemima received the best available education, and grew up into an intelligent, high-spirited girl of rare beauty and decidedly amorous disposition. After the death of her mother, her behaviour became so notorious that numerous family conferences were held, in the hope of getting her respectably married off as quickly as possible. Jemima laughed at their plans and continued to entertain her succession of suitors. She was approaching her twenty-second birthday when the transformation occurred. In 1774, she attended a meeting held by Anne Lee, the celebrated woman preacher and founder of the sect of Shakers, who immigrated from England a few months earlier. The Shakers demanded absolute chastity from the members of their flock, and denounced marriage and all commerce between the sexes as the deadliest of sins. Jemima Wilkinson was the unluckiest of converts to such principles, but she left the meeting deeply impressed and was observed to fall into a strange melancholy. Shortly afterwards, she became seriously ill with fever, followed by a trance in which she lay for ten days on her bed, with glazed eyes and soundlessly moving her lips. When she emerged from the spell, she announced that the lustful and deceitful soul of Jemima Wilkinson had vanished forever into the flames of hell. She had, she declared, actually died of the fever and been born again, with the same body this time inhabited by the Holy Spirit instead of a human soul. In vain the doctor told her that she was suffering from an hallucination, and even wrote out a legal affidavit that the original Jemima Wilkinson was still really and truly alive. Jemima refused to listen. She tore up the affidavit and threw it in the doctor's face. As soon as she could rise from her bed, she set out on her mission. In Boston, the bloody conflict on Bunker Hill had just launched the War of Independence. The colonies were in turmoil but that made no difference to Jemima's crusade. Calling herself the Universal Friend, she travelled through Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, speaking wherever she could gather a crowd in streets or in open fields. Soon thousands were flocking to listen to the woman evangelist, who held them spellbound with her passionate tongue, her statuesque beauty, and hypnotic dark eyes. The war with the British, she declaimed, was only a foretaste of the divine wrath to come unless the people sought salvation in repentance and spotless chastity. Around her she assembled a band of twenty fanatical disciples, men and women alike, who had abandoned their families and given up all their worldly possessions to finance the crusade of the universal friend. At their head, Jemima rode through towns and villages, holding meetings, lashing the sinful, and offering eternal redemption to those who contributed generously to her funds. 
When in 1776 her wanderings culminated in her entry into Providence, her arrival created a furor of dissension in the sober little capital of Rhode Island. Orthodox churches branded her a public scandal. An angry mob burned down the building where she held her meetings and threatened to throw her disciples in Narragansett Bay. But her oratory and fascination of her beauty also won Jemima Wilkinson many rich and influential supporters. Among them was Joshua Babcock, a close friend of George Washington and Stephen Hopkins, who had been royalist governor of Rhode Island in colonial times, and later turned rebel and signed the Declaration of Independence. However, her greatest benefactor was the elderly, doting Judge William Potter, who turned over his mansion in Kingston as the headquarters of the Universal Friends' Crusade. Jemima's more austere followers were already becoming disturbed by her greed for money, and in a few years she milked the judge of almost every dollar he possessed. Meanwhile, hostility to her teaching steadily rose. She was denounced as a blasphemer, a charlatan, and accused of breaking up families by her campaign against marriage and the procreation of children. When she toured Connecticut and Massachusetts, her meetings were stoned, her followers brutally assaulted, and more than once she herself had to flee for her life. After the War of Independence ended in 1781, she decided to abandon ungrateful New England to God's wrath and transfer her mission to Philadelphia, the temporary capital of the new United States. The city of brotherly love proved equally unfriendly. Her chapel was burned, and several times she had to go into hiding to escape persecution for blasphemy. Four years later, she was back in Providence. At 34, she was still in the prime of her beauty, and before long, Richard Myers had fully restored the losses of her disastrous Philadelphia enterprise. Now she announced that the Lord had directed her to quit the sinful towns and set up her community of saints in a place where no unholy spirit could ever intrude. Judge Potter handed over the remnants of his fortune, and with the aid of other converts she was able to acquire at a nominal rent a huge tract of land in Upper New York State. A small advance party was sent to survey the country, and in 1790 the Universal Friend, followed by Potter, and 100 of her most fanatical supporters. As the expedition toiled painfully over the mountain trails, with a string of pack horses and lumbering wagons, even the stoutest hearts began to fail. The territory on the shore of Lake Seneca was almost totally unexplored and lay on the uppermost limits of America's settlement along the western frontier. Scalp-hunting Iroquois and Mohawk Indians still lurked in the trackless forests. The only white men were a lawless breed of fur trappers as savage as the redskin themselves, or so it seemed. Some of Jemima's faithful turned back and were never seen again, but eighty pushed on to rejoin the advance guard on the lonely shore of the lake. There, driven by one woman's iron will, they began to hack a settlement out of the wilderness. It not only survived, but, miraculously, it prospered. Cornfields were ploughed around the log huts. Within a year, the saints had built a primitive flour mill, a sawmill, a chapel, and a timber stockade for protection. The Indians gave little trouble after Jemima fearlessly visited their wigwams, gave the chiefs presents, and persuaded them to sign treaties of peace. The Redskins called her the Great Talking Squaw, and were convinced that she must have supernatural powers if the Pale Faces allowed themselves to be ruled by a mere woman. By 1800, the population of the colony of New Jerusalem had grown to nearly 300, and every month new settlers struggled over the mountains to establish farms on the domain of the Universal Friend. But as the numbers grew, so did Jemima's tyranny, as she determined to maintain dictatorial rule over her subjects. Newcomers grew restless over her constant demands for goods and money, always prefixed by the statement, The friend hath need of these things, and must be obeyed. She was always devising new and degrading punishments for men or women guilty of breaching the iron law of chastity. One seducer was forced to go about with a black hood over his head for three months. Frail women were condemned to have tinkling bells fixed to the hems of their skirts. All disputes were judged personally by Jemima. Her decisions were enforced by a special squad of disciples who silenced any opposition with whips and bludgeons. With advancing years, Jemima became increasingly eccentric and despotic until she finally decided that the Holy Spirit no longer wished her to demean herself with the everyday running of the colony. 
Her decision was hastened by a sickness that ravaged her once beautiful face and left her a withered, disfigured crone who could walk only with the aid of sticks. In about 1815, she set aside 12,000 acres as her private estate, and on the remotest corner of it built a vast, rambling house set deep in the forest. There she lived for the last four years of her life, refusing to see any one but her servants, and ruling New Jerusalem by edicts nailed to a post in the township. Many of the settlers were uncertain whether she was alive or dead, and gradually the colony disintegrated, its members abandoned her teachings and went their separate ways. By the time Jemima Wilkinson, the universal friend, breathed her last on July 1st, 1819, New Jerusalem was little more than a name on the map. 